Hi everyone and welcome to our first Parlour Lab on Women in Architecture, Archives, Data, Visibility. We're so excited to have Jill Mathewson and Julie Collins with us today. Um, I'd like to begin today's Parlour Lab by acknowledging that we're gathered all across the country on the unceded lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Mianjin or Brisbane from the University of Queensland campus. Um, and would like to pay my respects to the Turrbal and the Yaga people and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, no, no, it's a, it's a... Elizabeth, mute yourself, please. Is that better? Um, so to start today, I'd like to throw over to Justine to welcome everyone before we get started. Hi, everybody. Um, as Carly said, welcome to the first Parlour Lab session. Uh, we're really very excited to have this new series up and running. Um, this is the first one. As you can tell, uh, we've got a, a, a new host. We're working with the University of Queensland on this event. We're delighted to be working with them, but we are still just working out the technical stuff. So um, excuse us. Some of you saw us juggling that, but you know what you all know what Zoom's like. Um, so, um, we're really excited to have this new series. Parlour has always operated in the space between research and practice, and we're very firmly committed to putting knowledge to work. Um, this this um, gap between practice and research is also one that I'm personally very interested in and, um, and, and like to kind of play between those two worlds. And so this series really is about trying to bring those two worlds closer together um, by sharing um, discussions about the, the great research that's happening in the built environment, um, starting off in Australia, but also with ambitions to spread more widely. Um, so uh, the series is convened by Macarena de la Vega de Leon and Carly Manain. Um, the idea of it actually came out of conversations um, that happened during our parlor salon where Carly was a speaker. Um, and I'd just like to now hand over to Macarena and Carly and say thank you very much for doing this great new series and um, <laughs> welcome everybody. Go Carly and Maca. Thanks Justine. <laughs> Thanks, Justine. Yeah, and welcome everybody. I'm Macarena de la Vega, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Melbourne. I also serve as communications manager of the Society of Architectural Historians of Australia and New Zealand, SAHANS, uh, which is one of the collaborators in this series. Now, uh, for today, we would just like to go very briefly through some uh, Zoom protocols. As always, please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're actually speaking. Please leave your camera on if you can. It's very nice to be able to see your faces and feel a sense of being here together. There will be an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. So if you have a question, please put it into the chat section. We will then choose questions and invite you to ask them live to our speakers. If you're not able to do that, just let us know in the chat and we can ask it on your behalf. We may not be able to get to all the questions, but they do help inform future events and plans. Awesome, thanks Maka. Um, I'm Carly, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a practicing architect, but I'm also finishing my PhD here at the University of Queensland. I'm studying architecture, the architecture of informal settlements in India. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce Jill today as our first um, speaker. Jill is an architect, a founding director of Parlour and a lecturer at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, Jill's PhD thesis was titled Dimensions of Gender, Women's Careers in the Australian Architecture Profession, which was published in 2015 at the University of Queensland. And this work led to a compilation and analysis of the comprehensive statistical map that is at the heart of much of Parlour's advocacy work. Um, she's now working at the XYX lab Gender and Place at Monash, and she's been researching how sex, gender and sexuality affects the spatial culture of cities, including who participates in and contributes to the production of city spaces. Thanks so much for being here today, Jill. Thanks, Carly. Right. So um, I think I might be known mostly uh, as the kind of numbers nerd of Parlour, or as my friend Charity once called me, the data diva. Um, and uh, it all came out of my PhD, which was part of a much larger project 
on equity and diversity that produce parlour itself. When I first started that PhD, there was a definite vibe from friends and colleagues of isn't that gender architecture stuff all a bit last century? So um, this is the diagram that changed that. It's a summary of all the stats that Kirsty Boltz and I dug up. Um, is that right? Are you, are you seeing my right screen? No. No, Jill. Sorry. It's saying it's right by me. Sorry, people. That's the one. Cool. All right. You got it now? Thank you. Um, we, so it's all these stats that Kirsty and I dug up, but we didn't know at the beginning that this is what we were going to produce. We kind of knew that listing lots of numbers just wasn't going to cut it. Architects are visually literate, but tend to glaze over the very second that you say the word percentage. So one day during my um, PhD, I was chatting about alternative medicines with one of my colleagues and friends, Amy Clark, and she showed me this. Um, so it's a great wee diagram if should you ever want to have a look at supplements. Um, uh, and I thought, oh, maybe I can do something similar with all our numbers. So these are my first attempts. I wanted something with bubbles kind of rising, but I was working in Word, which of course was never going to work. But the project fortunately had Georgina Russell as a summer intern, and she shaped it into the uh, infamous circle diagram. I did get to do my bubbles rising um, with the growth over time when I added to the PhD research in the 2018 Parlour Census Report. Most of the areas show uh, definite but really kind of slow growth over time, except for um, this one here. Oops, click that on. This one here, um, which is for people who are new admissions to the register. I also looked at the gender pay gap, and this was the initial uh, diagram for it. Very boring. Again, not going to cut it. Um, and this is what uh, graphic designer Jess Riley did with that bar diagram. And the pay gap, particularly here, just smacks you right in the face. This is the kind of research that I like to do because it changes everything, changes things. The circle diagram made the profession wake up to its inequity. And I reckon there are people out there who are working very hard at the moment to make sure that when we dig into the data for the 2021 census, that we don't get this result. What these visualizations do is activate data which leads to change. It builds bridges from um, research into making a real difference in the lives and careers of women. Um, for the last more than four years, I've been working with the XYX lab at Monash University, where we also want to make a real difference using our research into gender and place to impact the daily lives of women using public space. One of our biggest projects is looking at safety um, for women on public transport uh, at the moment. We found this table from a survey for London Transport looking at transportation settings where people felt safe, after, unsafe after dark. It's not very clear, so we turned it into we turned it into something which I somehow got rid of. Sorry about that, but I, t I can assure you it makes it very effective. All right. Um, um, but our research is not just about numerical data. There's also trying to distill it into very clear diagrams. Um, hang on, I've really got myself all mixed up. Sorry, people. Um, we also, um, which, so, this is the diagram that I want to show. So this one's about the impact of gender bias. There are many consequences of this, but the ones that um, impact access and inclusion of women in public space are gender-based gender violence and the gender um, bias built environment. And it's worth noting that there's a kind of feedback mechanism going on here. Um, and the violence and the environment also produce and reinforce gender inequality. Violence perpetrated by men affects how women and girls understand their place in the world. And gender bias in the built environment leads to places not designed for women's need, needs. 
both lead to subtle and not so subtle messages that women do not belong in the public space. In turn leads to women's caution in um, public spaces. And it's not that women don't enter these, uh, but it's too often they're, they're on guard or simply feel uncomfortable. Um, with both um, Parler and XYX, I've also analysed very large data sets uh, from surveys looking at patterns and the free text answers, which is what um, one of those earlier diagrams was about. Um, okay. So there, there is actually more to my work than kind of wrangling large Excel sheets, although sometimes I feel a bit buried by them. It matters how, as well as how many women are participating, both in public spaces and in the profession. So that's led to an interest in the culture of architecture with a sideline in how architects dress. And I've explored this mainly through um, Sahan's conference papers. In 2018, I looked at the shift of architecture students from wearing a smock to wearing black. So, uh, and they wore smocks up until the 1960s um, this, this to protect their um, everyday clothes. And it makes the crafting involved in the production of drawings and models explicit, but it was also symbolic, a claim to a certain kind of artistic uh, identity. But so too, in slightly different ways, is the wearing of black. In uh, 2012, I looked at architect Barbie, who, whilst challenging some of the stereotypes of what an architect might look like, like wearing pink, um, she does so in such a way that it was easily dismissed by the profession. So the Architects Journal did their own costume design for her, presenting an image much more acceptable to the profession. But it's also um, the image of a woman's body disciplined by the peculiar operation of both architecture and how women work with allowable presentations of the feminine. Um, both those papers are available on the Sahans website, I, I believe. Anyway, gender is the social and cultural process of beliefs, expectations and restrictions about women and men are and should be. In architecture, there are also shared beliefs expectations, restrictions, embedded in the ide ideologies of what architects are and should be. So my research investigates what happens when these two cultural systems collide, be that how it, um, it manifests on the bodies of women architects or on their career, but overall how gender impacts on the lives of all women as they enter what have traditionally been male controlled spaces and places. Thank you. Sorry for my mess up earlier. Thank you so much, Jill. That was really, really interesting. Um, now it is my, my pleasure to um, introduce Julie Collins. Uh, Dr. Julie Collins is a researcher and curator at the Architecture Museum at the University of South Australia. With a PhD and Bachelor of Architecture, Julie is an active researcher focusing on various aspects of architectural history from therapeutic places to architectural drawing collections and heritage. Her book, The Architecture and Landscape of Health, a historical perspective on therapeutic places from 1790 to 1940 was published in 2020 by Routledge, so just this year. Previous research projects includes working on women in the architectural profession, the influence of climate and colonial architecture of Adelaide, the history of psychiatric asylum landscapes and early tuberculosis sanatoria in Australia. So over to you, Julie, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. So I'm going to um, have an attempt at a screen share now. So we'll see how that goes and okay. So um, thank you. Um, um, as an introduction, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do in my role as curator and researcher here at the Architecture Museum um, at the University of South Australia, which um, is where I am right now. And I'll talk about some of the challenges involved in trying to deal with what have been described by archivists Waverley Lowell and Kelsey Shepherd as big, beautiful and unwieldy architectural drawings. 
So the collection itself was privately started in the mid-1970s by Donald Leslie Johnson. Um, some of you might know him as author of um, Sources of Modernism, um, which was quite a good book. Um, and he started with the cooperation of architects and their families to do a bit of an archival rescue mission, saving many architects' records and drawings from the bin, literally. Um, he started taking them home and hiding them, well, putting them, putting them under, them his, under bed, his bed, um, um, which I'm not I'm quite not sure how to do that. Um, um, but then in 1990, he gave the collection to the University of South Australia um, and it's now housed in the Ghana building at City West campus in Adelaide. So the Architecture Museum has as its aim to acquire, collect and preserve documents which are relevant to South Australian privately practising architects, planners as well as associated professionals, so interior designers um, and landscape architects as well. So I guess I've got a bit of a different big data issue to um, deal, um, which is physically, um, yeah, trying to fit it all in the room. Um, we hold more than 200,000 documents, which include over 20,000 architectural drawings, around about four or 5,000 antiquarian prints of architectural subjects, plus a 4,000 plus volume library of books, journals and trade literature as well as a small number of artefacts, mainly drafting tools. Quite often we hold some of the sole surviving copies of plans for South Australian buildings. So staffed by myself, just three days a week, um, with occasional research assistance, the Architecture Museum endeavours not only to generate research based on the records itself, but also to develop specialist knowledge about the records. Um, this is increasingly becoming important as we move into the digital realm. We have yet to accept our first uh, donation of born digital records, but we're well underway in preparing for them when they do arrive. Um, so it's also important because we're housed within a university that we produce outcomes. So journal articles, conference papers, books and exhibitions. We're open to the general public as well, and we have around about 350 in-person researchers visiting to look at records each year, and about double that number in terms of people contacting me with inquiries. So they'd be looking for particular architects' work or buildings. Um, we also run tours for students and interest, interest groups um, throughout the year. So while we're called a museum, it effectively operates as an archive and a research facility. Um, we don't have a huge gallery space. So we exhibit, we um, mount exhibitions in collaboration with external um, parties. So the Office for Design and Architecture, SA, um, we have help from the Architectural Practice Board, the Institute, um, as well as um, private architectural firms who support us as well. Um, so we use galleries which are either on campus or off campus to display our exhibitions. Um, architectural architectural record record of found in other uh, libraries as well as galleries, university collections and um, archives across Australia. So when they do arrive, this is pretty much what we get. Um, and once we've accepted a donation, the sheer volume of architectural drawings and their physical state um, can often make it really, really difficult to do any kind of assessment or accessioning. Unfortunately, they generally arrive with no list. Um, so the task of unrolling large format drawings, some which have been rolled up for you know half a century quite often, can be a challenge in itself um, and a process which I've been often known to compare with wrestling an octopus. No sooner do you get one corner down than the other corner springs up um, and it can be really um, quite time consuming the flattening process. Flattening them um, can take around about three to six months um, depending on the paper type and how long they've been rolled um, and also the damage which has been caused to them sometimes requires a little bit of conservation work. But once they've been unrolled and catalogued and given their own number, 
they're safely tucked away into metal plans filing drawers. Um, from there, we can get them out um, when they're requested by users. For correspondence, ephemera, reports and specifications, they luckily fit in boxes. And after cleaning and numbering, um, we rehouse them in poly sleeves into uh, standard archive boxes. So how are these records used? Well, um, as I said, we're open to the public. So quite often we have heritage um, architects, we have building owners, we have family historians. We've even had a few novelists coming to look for settings for um, imaginary worlds. Um, we have students from all of the universities in the state um, actually coming to use us both for history projects as well as architectural projects. The staff here at UniSA um, quite often if they're doing uh, adaptive reuse, we'll use the original plans that we hold here and we'll get students familiar with how to use um, architectural plans for, um, that are not um, on their screen. Um, my learnt to do um, architectural research during my PhD and bachelor's um, and these days um, I focus mainly on architectural history. So some of the buildings that I've looked at have included um, the, the plans of the Small Home Service of South Australia, which we hold, um, some of the therapeutic buildings, so um, tuberculosis sanatoria and asylums. Um, we also hold a really good collection of um, heritage reports on various buildings. Um, so they've been um, really valuable in terms of a research resource too. Um, so these are just some of the types of items that we hold. Um, and it's amazing once you kind of um, get them scanned and, and put them on a screen, that something which might be a scruffy drawing um, can turn out looking pretty spectacular. Um, and once you get them in a frame and on the exhibition wall, um, they're really quite um, impressive. Um, uh, well, they're impressive works of art, some of them in themselves, but. I think what I find most interesting is the cultural significance of these architectural records. Um, moving forward, I'm currently working on visual literacy and born digital design records, um, and also continuing looking at architecture planning and disease, which is something which suddenly this year has taken on a whole new meaning. meaning. Um, so I think I'll, I'll finish up there. Um, that's just a very, um, brief introduction to my work um, and I look forward to having a bit more of a conversation with you now. Thank you so much Julie that was really interesting and it, both you and, and Jill deal with such vast amounts of data. Um, Macarena and I were wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you go th through such large amounts of information and decide on what's relevant, what's the, the kind of process that you take. Um, maybe Julie, you can go first and then we can get J Jill to jump in. Yeah, um, so thanks. Um, I think research can be really time consuming and really laborious. Um, and for me though, it can actually be going through all the records which might amount to boxes or drawers of them but it's kind of only by going through and putting in that time that sometimes you can find that smallest little clue which can set off the research or kind of make it relevant um, something which might be a tiny innocuous piece of paper can all of a sudden lead you off I guess it's down a rabbit hole is one way of looking at it but um, it can also kind of set you off um, into looking at things in a new way. So for example, um, the Marjorie Simpson collection, um, which we received a good many years ago, um, she had a little note in it, which she wrote to Jack Cheeseman saying, hey, thanks a lot for um, letting me look through the small home service records. They're really invaluable and really almost forgotten um, group of records. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So it was just a tiny little square piece of paper, this handwritten note, and it just made me think, okay, well, I'll just, just dig into this small home service. I've, I've heard about, I thought she was talking about Robin Boyd's Victorian small home service, but no, it turned out there was a South Australian one too. So this tiny little record in amongst all of her other um, work um, then ended up being 
the beginning of some research I did and I ended up with two journal articles produced on the small home service and it's um, something which I've kind of, yeah, really hoped to bring to attention in South Australia that we were doing a few interesting things here too. So I think sometimes it's the labour um, that goes into big data um, in the archival sense that is the payoff and yes, it can be boring and time consuming, but it's worthwhile. Yeah, cool. Does that same process work for you, Jill, in finding those little gems to kind of go down the rabbit hole? Oh, yeah, there's lots of rabbit holes to go down. Um, you know, with my PhD, I interviewed over 70 architects, which was way too many. So I had transcripts, which was like a thousand pages of transcripts. Um, and the only way to do it is just to keep going over and over and over the material. Um, and something that will jump out at you and you sort of think, oh, that's interesting. But does anybody else say the same thing? And then you find someone else does, and then you start gathering it. But also you can get um, people where, where someone, um, you know, uh, just says something and you think, oh, that's interesting, but nobody else repeats it. And you can't cherry pick, which is always a, a, a great temptation. But yeah, you just have to bury yourself in it, really, and uh, it, it, you go through it. Um, yeah, it just, it, 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 it's time consuming, but it kind of pays off. And for me, there's always something that kind of bugs me, that keeps me going. You know, I mean, the situation of women in architecture has been bugging me for decades, uh, which is why I felt really um, privileged to be able to do the PhD associated with that, with that work. But often it's something I'm not so interested in things that I think are wonderful or anything like that. I'm interested in knowing why I'm, I'm bugged by something. Why, why is it like that? And how, how, how can we explain it? So that's, that's how I keep going. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, I guess another question for both of you and um, Julie kind of already touched on it, but we were interested in knowing something that had come up um, from your research that surprised you. Because Jill, you were just talking of, you know, what keeps you going? What is it that you're looking for? But then there are things that come up that are totally unexpected, like what Julie was saying about um, Robin Boyd. So if you both would like to share um, something that has surprised you that you weren't expecting. Oh, there's always lots of surprises, I think. Um, one of the things that sort of surprised me, but also really annoyed me, was when we were doing the work on public transport and safety for women. We found out women and researchers have been researching this for 40 years and been saying more or less the same thing, that women's experience of public transport is different from men's, and yet everybody who designs public transport thinks the generic commuter, you know, is, is the only person that uses public transport. So that, you know, I mean, to find out it's been going on for 40 years and being ignored for 40 years was um, sort of both surprising and also kind of not surprising in a way. Um, it's, uh, you know, kind of a bit par for the course, sadly. Um, one of the things that came out of my PhD, though, was um, something to do with... Uh, specialization that a lot of women uh, specialize within within the practice and it's a way of making themselves distinct um, and it seemed to help with their continued employment um, so I, I thought that was kind of interesting um, when I was looking at smocks and the wearing of smocks and architecture I found uh, a little clip which was about the University of Pennsylvania School of Architecture and the first year students were not allowed to wear smocks. But towards the end of the year, they had to fight one of the second year students and get the smock off them. And you just sort of think, oh my God, the strange kind of rituals that go on. You know, it's just kind of, it's bizarre really, but it's kind of, it's fun when you find that sort of thing. Julie? Um, I think, I mean, I guess 
I was as surprised by the global pandemic as everybody else. Um, but in a way, that surprised me. I, I'd been working on my research around therapeutic buildings and health um, over the past two years. Um, and one of the big findings out of that was how important ventilation was and air circulation and space and distance and what we now call social distancing, how important that was in terms of modern architecture. Um, and when I say modern, I mean going back into the 19th century as well, but modern ways of living um, and looking at tuberculosis sanatoria, looking at the way light, air and openness, the kind of the modernist credo, um, emanated from fear of uh, airborne disease um, and fear of um, a respiratory disease um, and how our architecture kind of reflected that in the spaces which were created in that early 20th century. Um, and all of a sudden, now that we've got um, COVID-19, all of a sudden we're thinking in possibly a similar way to the way that people were thinking back in the late 19th century about what's airborne, what are germs, how is it transmitted and how is our architecture going to respond to this? It's, um, it's surprising looking back at the conversations which were going on in that kind of late 19th, early 20th centuries and seeing similar things being mentioned today in terms of the language. Um, we've got different phrases around them, but um, essentially people are people. People behave in certain ways that people behave in. And when you don't have a cure or a vaccine, all of a sudden architecture can be really significant. And I think that surprised me this year um, very much so. Um, just, just on that line, something that bugged me, I'm gonna try and prop this, share my screen this time. Um, if you visited Villa um, Savoir, you know, Le Cabousier's Pièce de Résistance, I don't know if you've noticed it, but there's a wash hand basin right by the front door. How about that? And it, it was one of those things that puzzled me when I first saw it. But this year, I sort of think, no puzzle at all. Wash your hands as soon as you come in the door. And it would have been designed after the um, Spanish influenza. So it's a, now it's a no-brainer. But when I visited back in whenever, I thought it was really kind of odd. Mm. Not odd. Smart. That's amazing. Great photos. Um, I think it's really interesting how we can suddenly understand in a, on a level which we, well, I certainly couldn't understand before. Um, before, you know, April this year, it was all a little bit academic, so to speak. Now, now I understand how they would have felt in my kind of, in my very being, which is really kind of really interesting in terms of um, understanding history at, at a different level. Yeah, and amazing how short our memories can be. Um, we have a question from the audience, um, Ingrid Pearson. Ingrid, would you like to ask your question? If you turn on your camera and microphone, are you there? Yes, oh, yeah. I had two questions. One for Jill, which was about the safety and how women feel not doesn't don't feel as safe in public spaces. So I, I wondered whether the um, Accepted principles of safe design that we have in New South Wales. I don't know if it's state, you know, other states have it. Do help create a much safer environment for women where they feel safe because of the principles that are used in, in the septet. So that's the first question for, for Julie. The, the question for Julian is, you were saying you haven't received any sort of digitized new works come into the museum as yet, but are you sort of fairly up to date with until all the um, hand-drawn documentation or even AutoCAD um, documentation has happened uh, for some of the buildings, but, you know, can't be digitized. I mean, can't be um, recorded. Okay, shall I, I'll go first. Um, the SEPTED principles, they, they work to a certain level, but you really need to sort of put a kind of um, 
gender lens over them. So we kind of combine them with um, uh, women's safety audit stuff. And there is a limit to how, how much design can do because it's also about who's in the space. You know, if you go into a space and there's just a whole bunch of 18-year-old guys, you're not going to feel terribly safe. And that's got nothing to do with the design of it. But we have um, we did some work with a, a charity called Plan International, and they had a, a an app, crowd mapping thing, which looked, asked young women to choose safe and unsafe places around Melbourne. And then we were working with uh, Arab and uh, a lighting designer there, Hoa Yang, who is, she, she went out and she measured the light levels in all the safe places and all the unsafe places throughout Melbourne. And she discovered that actually the lighting in um, safe places were, was within a kind of quite narrow band of colour temperature, uh, illuminance and all the other kind of technical stuff that I don't quite understand what it means. Um, and that was really surprising. We were not expecting that. So often people say, oh, you've got to put more light everywhere. You've got to have more lights, more lights, more lights. But there's problems with more lights, more lights, more lights. It does terrible things to the local um, fauna and things like that. So um, her, her, her reading is you don't need more light, but you do need to think very carefully about the light and think about how it's done and how, you know, just a big flood lighting is no good at all. So, um, so SEPTED works to a certain amount, and I think there's a lot more work to be done in lighting, and Ho is now doing her PhD on this, which is really exciting work. So it works to up to a certain limit, but not everything. So, Julie. Yeah, so in terms of born digital records, um, uh, our paper records, which we've been accepting, um, they are reaching into the 2000s now. So we've got documents um, in the collection up to about 2005. Um, generally, we only receive uh, donations once they're no longer current records. So the firm has um, closed down or the architect themselves has retired um, and that's when we'll receive the records. Um, Born Digital, quite often they're still current records and at the moment, as I said, we've got paper uh, documents, so people will have printed out on paper, um, uh, basically plan section elevations, those kind of records, um, and we've received them. So they might have been born digital, but we haven't received the digital files. Um, moving forwards, we've done a few tests um, in terms of looking at how we recover um, born digital files. So the ones who, which were created in the 1990s, uh, we've had in, uh, quite a bit of, had to do a bit of forensics um, in terms of recovering these records. Uh, it's surprising how few people used file naming conventions in the 1990s. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, there's, there's hardware and software issues as well as licensing issues. So the software which they may have been created with either might not exist anymore or they, we might not own that software or have that version of software. Um, there's a few projects going on around about, um, around the country and around, across the world, trying to look at how we're going to recover this. There possibly will be a digital dark, digital dark age, so to speak, of records which were created in that late 80s into the early 2000s, where because of record keeping, um, project, uh, pro, uh, record keeping kind of issues, um, not many might not survive. We're not still not really sure. Um, we're putting in systems and a collections policy going forwards. So we'll be able to at least keep some stable copies of some of the records. They won't necessarily, we not, won't necessarily be able to view them in the similar way to, the, to what they look like when they were produced, but at least we'll be able to capture the information. Um, it's quite, it's quite alarming how quickly files become corrupted. I mean, one of the things we're saying to most architectural practitioners now, and we've been working with Nat Spec on a project like this, is running checksums over your files to find out whether there's corruption, 
storing three copies of each file, um, hopefully two copies in two separate places, um, and these are digital files, um, and then at least you're kind of covered. Um, and also just check your uh, check what your cloud server um, conditions are and what happens if the cloud goes broke. Um, so um, there's a few basic things like that. And moving forward, these are, these are things we're going to have to deal with because it won't be um, physical storage that's an issue anymore. It's going to be digital storage and also corruption of files. Um, and also looking at uh, who owns digital files, what are the original copies, and if you do um, keep things saved in cloud servers and things like that, who owns the data um, are other issues. So there's a lot of quite big issues to do with those, um, which in a way makes paper, paper doc documents look mighty easy to deal with. Yes, totally, totally, Julie. Thank you. Thank you both for that. And thank you, Ingrid, for the questions. Um, I, I would like to invite Katriona Quinn to pose her question. I think it's a question that would also apply for Jill um, as well, thinking about the lab. Um, Katriona, if you don't want to, if you don't mind posing the sure. question. Sure, I, I actually entered uh, video switched off, so I can't give you a picture of me but um, so yeah my question I think in, in, in a time when um, both the teaching of um, history of you know interior design and architecture is under threat and and um, associated archives are under threat um, I'm really interested to know whether you've been able Julie to integrate the um, your archives and insert it into undergraduate curriculum and master's degree curriculum in a more structured way than just open access. That's my first um, query. And then my second question, I'd love to know a bit more about what your interior design holdings are and if you're actively collecting in that area. Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, the educational setting that we work in, um, we've actually got really, we've got a great set of staff here. <laughs> Um, at UniSA um, and they've actually, most of them spend a bit of time, I'm lucky I'm on the ground floor and everyone has to walk past the architecture museum on the way up to their offices or the studios and vice versa and also on the way to the coffee shop. So <laughs> um, hence I get a lot of drop-ins from staff who are, when they're planning um, the studios for the semester, um, basically drop in here. Um, for the interior staff, they're quite often looking for existing building plans. So they're really engaged in terms of what we've got here in the collection, um, really engaged with, um, so adaptive reuse as well for the architecture students, but really engaged with using real buildings with real plans and real problems, um, which, are, which they'll take the students out to visit and then the students will use original drawings. Um, as well, which is great um, in terms of a hands-on, it's kind of object-based learning um, as well. So this, yeah, the students are very engaged. They're really excited when they get to see original plans and drawings. Um, there's still nothing like, um, nothing like a beautifully watercolored um, elevation to uh, capture the students' uh, attention, which is great. Um, so, yeah, I think w we feel really quite embedded in terms of the way the school works um, and, and interior design um, as a profession and its history um, is kind of, yeah, understood. We've got, um, we're kind of, at, we are actively collecting interior design um, practitioners' works. Um, I have found though women are very reticent to donate their works. Um, and this is something I've read about in the past. Um, but gradually um, we, we, we actually find sometimes it's their, their daughters or their sons who will do make the donation. Um, quite often after they've passed away, um, their family who are proud of what they've done will actually donate um, women's works more than women will donate their own records. Uh, we've got a few interior design collections, but we've also got interior designers' documents uh, donated within architects' collections and also within engineers' collections, surprisingly. So we've got um, people who call themselves interior specialists um, in the 1920s and 30s. We've got some of their works. So there's the kind of, 
you know, before there was a, a real specialization which developed, we've got a few, yeah, quite a few beautiful interiors um, there. We've also got quite a good pamphlet um, and journal collection, um, which captures a lot of the, the photograph, uh, like work which was photographed of um, interior specialists um, in that kind of 20th century period. That's all fantastic to hear. Is any of that digitised or not? No, so we don't, um, as I'm only three days a week, um, yeah. we don't have a big digitisation, online digitised um, collection, but we digitise on demand for people. So once researchers have contacted me, if they're interested in particular items, if they're interstate or overseas, I can digitise for them. Quite often it'll just be um, a quick camera um, shot. Um, and then if they're interested in a high resolution copy, um, I can get that to them. We've got um, our collections lists online as PDF finding aids. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, as I said, we get hundreds of inquiries every year. Um, and most of them come through me. So I'm quite open to having conversations with researchers and people who are interested in this um, about what they're looking for and whether we can help them out by providing them um, with this kind of information. And it's a, it's a community kind of, it's a professional and community service really. Um, we're hoping to just, you know, improve the understanding of all of our professions um, as well. Totally. Um, Jill, I don't know if you would like to talk about if you have a relationship between the lab uh, and the architecture curriculum at Monash um, in the same way Julie was talking about the museum. Um, not at the moment, but it's something that we're kind of working on. Yeah. So we have, um, there has been a, a studio project that was run but it was mainly through the design school okay um, our next question is from justine if you want to ask it i love this i love <laughs> anyone <laughs> one who's not trying to field the questions um I, my question kind of follows on a little, little bit from um what Julie was saying about women being reluctant to, to donate their uh, material. Um, Julie, I know you've researched many, many things, but one of the things you have looked at is women, women in architecture. Um, and I guess, so the question is really for both of you is how do you find women in the archive? So sometimes you might have a collection of a particular woman, but quite often the records are slim. And I know Jill's done her own detective work in the past on um, finding finding women in the archive. And I just wondered if you might talk a little bit to that, both of you. <laughs> well, um, my master's pro by, pro uh, by research project, which was called Sex, Lies in the Barcelona Pavilion, catchy title. Um, I was, part of it, I was looking at the presence of Lily Reich in the process of, of, of um, uh, the making of the Barcelona Pavilion which of course we all know is Miss Van der Rohe's great heroic work and all the rest of it. But, um, and I didn't have access, there, there is, uh, she does have some papers uh, and they're in New York, but they only survived because they were mixed up with Miss Van der Rohe's papers. Mm -hmm. She had kept those. Um, anyway, so I was looking at, at the way historians were writing about um, Nice over that over the 1920s and 30s period and I started seeing some little kind of disjunctions you know there was a difference to his work over that period and there were all these kind of um, little kind of hints so it was a process of kind of just kind of uncovering those little hints and things um, but what I kind of realized about 10 years after I'd done that work was I kind of portrayed um, Libby Reich as a, as, as a victim, both of um, Miss van der Rohe being a bit of a asshole, basically, um, to her, but also the historians not giving her her proper place in history. Um, and then I realised I'd done the same thing, I'd made her into a victim. Mm. And um, so I did a Sahans paper in 2002 about that, where I was sort of thinking, I was reflecting on my work and thinking, 
why the hell did I do that? But, you know, it's kind of um, really important. It doesn't, you know, even when you're making someone a victim, somehow you are still exposing them and, and getting them moved into the right place. And then you've got to sort of think again and sort of think, oh, okay. So this process of uncovering women, it's, there are often very, very, very slender traces. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be really careful how you do it. And you can't sort of say, well, they don't exist because I can't find the papers. You have to have to kind of be a little bit devious about it, really. Um, yeah, so it, it makes a difference. And we do have to know that history. Otherwise, we will repeat it. And we'll once again disappear from history. We'll be wiped out. If you don't mind jumping, that I jump here, uh, there is a Spanish researcher that just this year has tried to make a bit of justice uh, with Lily uh, Wright and the pavilion. So I just put the, the links there on the chat. Um, oh, cool. it's, it's a first step, but um, it's, it's being done. It's being done. Sorry, Julie, I, I stopped there. It was your turn. That's okay. Um, I think um, detective work um, is kind of the key to it. Detective work um, and also family history methods um, can work quite well. Um, so, yeah, quite often, especially um, once a woman has become married and decided to change her name, um, that can be a bit of a, um, all of a sudden, they can become a little bit lost. So I think family history methods and also, I mean, Trove, which I think of us will have heard of Trove, which is the National Library of Australia's um, uh, aggregator, um, which has newspapers digitised um, for um, quite a, a fair few years of Australia's history. Um, you can actually track down using, you know, births, deaths and marriages and things like that, track down women and work out where they were and what they were doing um, a fair bit. I think... Also, um, sometimes they might become lost to the profession of architecture, but that doesn't mean they're lost in their own lives or something. Um, so many of the women who might, who might have studied architecture but then pulled back and decided to take a different path um, have done wonderful things. Um, Esther Legault became an incredible photographer um, whose work was then um, exhibited nationally. Um, there are other, Margaret Wollaston, who's another person who trained as an architect, um, became a draftsman and then had an incredible career as a potter um, in ceramics and exhibited her work globally as well. So, and it's surprising actually how many women who trained in architecture became incredible craftspeople um, and incredible um, artistic having an artistic career and also wonderful, having wonderful roles in terms of mothering, in terms of um, other fulfilling lives, in terms of charity work. So not everyone who gets lost to the architectural profession might be doing it, yeah, because they're a victim. They might be doing it because they've chosen that actually, no, I want to live my life in a different way. And I think this has been really this can be a comfort as well to some of us who have chosen. I mean, I didn't choose to go out and practice. I kind of went down a different route and then ended up being a museum curator um, and writing history, something I never thought I'd be doing when I was studying architecture. I mean, I did have a side career as a florist for a while after I graduated. And that in itself, I think, was really valuable and actually taught me quite a lot that I'm drawing on now in my, you know, yarn bombing and crafting side of my life. So I think um, women's stories are diverse and they're rich and they're wonderful. And just because they didn't end up in the Architecture Museum with an archive does mean their lives were not incredible. So, yeah. I think that's absolutely right. I think there's also still many, many women um, go, you know, moving into other areas, trained in architecture, doing really important and significant and interesting and fulfilling things. So I think that's a mind you. I would yeah. like to add that if anyone has got architectural women um, who have got a South Australian connection please encourage them to donate their, their wet records to the Architecture Museum because that's another active area of collecting. And I think across Australia and the world as well, please encourage professional women to donate their records to archives and libraries and 
museums because they're part of the story of our lives. Um, they're there doing stuff and the men are not going to be, um, sorry, I shouldn't generalise, but quite often the men are really happy to get out there and donate where the women are, are quite um, possibly a little bit um, holding back on donating their records. But I think it's really important these people's careers across all the professions and, and all the areas are, are, you know, there to tell the story of how we lived our lives today. Yeah, that's, that's great, Julie, thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions that are a bit too specific. Uh, so I hope that the audience doesn't mind that we begin to wrap up. Um, there was something about this series that we want all of you to leave kind of with a key takeaway um, aspect of, of these two women's work. Um, so Gillian and Julie, if you don't mind, um, you know, what would be, you know, very, very concisely a key takeaway from, from the work you do and that you would want the audience mainly, you know, also practicing architects to, to keep in mind in their daily, um, daily work. Gosh, that's not a small question, is it? Um, I think I think my thing would be about you do have to be vigilant, and the the erasure that kind of happens to women over time. It's it hasn't stopped with the twenty first century. It hasn't stopped with the advent of parlour or any other of these things. So you do need to be vigilant and you do need, as Julie says, definitely donate your, your work. Make sure it's not destroyed because there will be generations of women after you who, who will want, want to kind of find them. Um, and yeah, gender is very sneaky and gender bias is very sneaky. It just slips sneaks in and, and when you least expect it, it'll knock you out at the knees and you'll just sort of think, how the hell did that happen? It'll happen. So you've just got to be vigilant. Vigilant. Yeah, one word. Um, to sum up, I think, um, I think I kind of hinted at this in my last answer to Justine was that um, I mean, I never expected to follow a, a writing architectural history path. I never expected to become a curator of a collection. Um, but I'm really happy that I'm doing this now. Um, and I think if you kind of follow your in interests and follow your path, um, somehow big data and um, things which seem insurmountable um, can actually have really, really big rewards. So um, yeah, and anyone who's in Adelaide and wants to pop into the Architecture Museum, feel free. I'd really love you to see it in person. I'm, I'm really glad that you decided to wrestle with those octopuses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll definitely be taking a visit next time I go to Adelaide and Jill, I will be staying vigilant. Thank you so much, both um, Jill and Gillian, for your um, fantastic presentations and conversations today. Um, that's uh, almost up for time. So before we end, um, if anyone has um, would like to get involved with this series or has any comments or feedback, please let us know. Um, we're really happy to um, have people join us as hosts or, or if anyone's willing to share their research, we'd love to hear from you. Um, a big thank you to UQ for hosting and Sahans for collaborating on this project and for Parla uh, for trusting myself and Maka to, to lead the charge of this um, research talking to practice series. We're really excited um, by the potential of the series and so happy to have you all here um, for this first event. So thank you also to Parla's partners. Um, and it was lovely to see everyone's faces today. What a great start to the week. <laughs> Thank you all yes. so much. And we'll see you next month for the um, Parlour Lab number two. Looking forward to it. Thank Thanks you so all much, so much. Everyone.